Hey guys, I'm here today to do an update on a video I did back in April about films. Funnily enough, I've had to look back at the video to double check all the films listed and I realised I'm wearing the same shirt, similar colour makeup and my hair is the same because at the time I hadn't managed to get my hair cut because all the hairdressers had closed and we're now back in the same situation so I feel like I've gone through some sort of time warp and I'm back in April. So, I made a list of 20 films that I wanted to watch with Johnny throughout lockdown and in the video I ambitiously said oh I think we'll have these watched by the end of May because 20 videos like six weeks and we're indoors all the time. Johnny and I had chosen 10 films each and we were going to watch them in like a random order and we've only watched 10. <laughs> so reason being is we started to watch them and didn't have a great success with quite a few of them which was a shame and also realised that a lot of them were pretty bleak and it was around the time that my chronic pain started to get a lot worse and so the combination of chronic pain and depressing films just didn't go together so instead we just like re-watched old favourites of TV or watched easy stuff or I just watched lots of booktube guys like I don't even know how much more reading and film watching I could get done if I didn't watch as much booktube so I'm here today to wrap up the 10 we have watched and I've put them in order of least to most favourite and we have films across all the ranges now because we rate our films and keep a record of them all on IMDb and IMDb unlike Goodreads allows you to rate out of 10 these are all going to be rated from 0 to 10. So very sadly one of my picks which I was really excited for and this probably had the most comments from you guys saying how much you enjoyed it so I was really disappointed by it because I was expecting to really enjoy it and that was Train to Busan. This is a Japanese film, I've never watched anything from this director before and it is set on a train to Busan while a sort of zombie virus is taking over and you're following a father who is trying to take his daughter back to her mother because they're separated and he's trying to like keep her alive for the journey. The young girl actress is called Su An Kim and I actually thought she was excellent and like the only good thing about the film. The film was trying to be a serious zombie film there were so many points where it just was silly and I think the error, I was trying to figure out like who messed up and I think the error has to lie with the person who wrote the script because there's loads of points where if they just like moved a bit differently through the train or like taken a different amount of time to do something they would have been absolutely fine but it's like the film purposely put them in moments of peril and as a viewer I was just thinking well you could have avoided that if you'd done this really simple thing and the, the finale of the film, which I won't spoil, that is like really apparent. So something happens which is just completely silly and if the character had just been a bit more cautious then like everything would have been fine. So it just became a bit of a joke to watch it really. So I gave that one 4 out of 10. The next one is also one of my picks and that is Wildlife. So I had really high hopes for this one because it's directed by Paul Dano, who's an actor I really enjoy. And it features Carrie Mulligan and Jake Gyllenhaal, who are both excellent. And I was like, I'm going to really enjoy this one. I didn't. So this is about a marriage that is breaking down. Jake Gyllenhaal's character is going away to fight wildfires. And it's almost like he wants something dangerous. He wants an adrenaline rush. So he leaves. And you're sort of following the teenage son as he's realising that his parents' marriage is breaking down. And as he's sort of being taken along um, with each of their breakdowns. And it's just one of those films, you know, I really enjoy slow, character-focused films where the acting just excels. And this could have been that, but just nothing excels. It's very one note and nothing just is elevated enough to make this a really stand-up film. So I found this entirely forgettable, like I won't remember this in a few months' time. So I gave that one five stars. The next one is one of Johnny's picks and it's The Lighthouse. And this is directed by Robert Eggers, who did The Witch. We both love The Witch, so... I nearly put this on my list but I was pretty certain Johnny would put it on his. It is about two men who are working on a remote island and they are looking after the lighthouse. Um, the two men are acted by Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson, both excellent actors. I really enjoy um, watching most of the films they are in. And the acting was phenomenal but this was just not for me so Johnny enjoyed this film much more than me and this film is a perfect example of the types of films Johnny and I disagree on. So in general over the years we, we agree on like all the ratings of films so we've I think we've got about 600 films we've rated on our IMDb account we've been together for 14 years 
and you know nine out of ten times if not more we agree on the exact score out of ten um, these are the types of films we disagree on and um, hereditary is another example and i would say the reason we disagree on these films is because i find they're sort of too arty too style over substance and they just get a bit silly and they become unenjoyable for me to watch and whilst i can admire like the artistry that's gone into them the way they're shot and all that i just can't enjoy it and so as an as an experience it's not fun so i gave that one five out of ten as well so the next two films were johnny's picks the first one being the sisters brothers this is obviously adapted from the novel the sisters brothers by patrick de Witt, which i did read when it came out didn't love it and i feel the same way about the film solid if you're into you know stories set around that time you know the gold rush this is set in 1850s oregon then you'll probably enjoy it more than me I think I have a real aversion to those types of stories because I grew up with a family who loved John Wayne films so we constantly watched lots of awful cowboy and Indian films and I find that all of these stories are super populated by white men and we rarely see anyone else and yeah just not really interested in it so this features John C. Riley and Jacqueline Phoenix and they are the sisters brothers and they basically are like hired hitmen so they go around and kill people and get paid for it and John C. Riley's character is starting to feel like he's not so into this anymore maybe he wants to stop killing people and settle down his brother doesn't agree and they eventually come across Jake Gyllenhaal and get involved in the gold rush this is directed by Jacques Ariad I'm sorry if i've butchered that i'm really not good with french pronunciation this director directed the prophet and rust and bone both films i love and highly recommend way more than this one so this was just like a six out of ten for me like it's good if, if it's something you're interested in then i say watch it you know the acting's really solid but it's just something that i'm gonna forget not really a great film for me next one is thunder road this is directed and acted by Jim Cummings so he acts the main guy in this I haven't experienced any of his work before and this is a 6 out of 10 as well this is about a police officer who loses his mother and the film opens with her funeral where he seems to be acting in a way that the rest of society don't think is appropriate so his grief isn't what people expect to see so in the opening scene he brings like a boom box to the chapel and he does sort of interpretive dance for his mother and everybody thinks he's losing it but you know as you watch more of the film you learn that it's the sort of thing his mother would have adored um, and he just isn't held back by like societal expectations so i thought this was an interesting film you it appears that the the main character is neurodiverse it's not specified but he certainly seems to struggle with communicating and the main thrust of the film is following his relationship with his daughter he is separated from her mother and so he has her at weekends and he's really struggling with communicating with her so I felt this is a film that could have been really great. There was a couple of scenes where the chemistry between the two actors, him and his daughter, was excellent. And it's one of those films that does that and you're waiting for it to, to do that and it just didn't. So yeah, 6 out of 10. If you're interested in it, watch it. But I didn't love this one. Okay, the next one was one of my choices. This is Leave No Trace. It's directed by Deborah Granick, who directed Winter's Bone, which I love and need to rewatch. I've only seen it once, but I... Um, loved the, the sort of atmosphere of that film and the cinematography was excellent. Didn't enjoy this one as much but it's still uh, a good film. This is about a father and his daughter who are living in a national park. They live off the grid because the father has severe PTSD and he can't like cope in normal society but very early on in the film they are reported to social services and sort of told they have to try and adapt as much as possible and the film is watching them adapt, trying to adapt and watching how the daughter copes with that differently to the father. The father's acted by Ben Foster, who I've seen him in a few films, I think he's always good. Um, I think in most films I've seen him in he's like a supporting actor so I think he was really strong in this one as the lead. But this was a film again where I felt like it was doing this and it was all really good and really solid and I was just waiting for it to do that. It's interesting, I've just realised these are both this and Thunder Road are both about father-daughter relationships. Although I will say that the communication between 
this father and daughter is, is really great. Um, they just don't agree. So yeah, beautiful. A lot of it is set outside in the wilderness in forests. But I just wanted it to just have a bit more like oomph at the end and that didn't happen. So the next two are films I chose. The first one is called Choplifters. It's a Japanese film directed by Hirokazu Kureda. I hope I've said that right. So this director also directed Nobody Knows and Still Walking, which is why I wanted to watch another one of his films because I really enjoyed both of those. Nobody Knows remains, like if I had to make a list of the most difficult films to watch in terms of how devastating they are, Nobody Knows would easily make the top five. But I highly recommend it, it's a phenomenal film. Shoplifters wasn't quite as good. Everybody in Shoplifters was phenomenal, so I'm not even going to name any of the cast because you know, I have to name like seven or eight people, they were all excellent, so I cannot knock the acting. This is about a sort of made family, so we follow this couple who live with a woman who's, I think, one of their grandmothers, um, and they have a few children who are also there. And at the start of the film, they find a little girl who is living with parents who are incredibly violent and then they're neglecting her and so they take her home just for the night and then it ends up not being just for the night. And the film is really about how they survive as a family, how they interact with one another, how they're connected to one another and how they live outside of society. So they are shoplifters, they're very good at it. And lots of the film is just slow scenes watching the family eat dinner together, watching the family go and shoplift, watching the family come home and show the, the others what they managed to shoplift and it is you know a really good film but I, but I felt as I have with quite a few of these films that it was going like this and it just needed an extra it needed an extra boost there's also something at the end of the film um, it got a bit more plotty towards the end um, and I felt like it got a bit confused in terms of I don't know like the connections between characters I didn't think was was completely clear Johnny and I were trying to figure out if that's like an oversight on our part or maybe that didn't come across as well um, with subtitles as it would have done um, you know as a, as a Japanese viewer without subtitles so yeah I enjoyed this one you know I, but I, I've preferred other films that this director has done and then another film we gave 7 out of 10 is We the Animals this is based on a novel by Justin Torres I think this is quite an autobiographical novel Justin Torres is actually involved in um, you know adapting this to the screen so he was one of the three um, screenplay writers for this film this follows a Puerto Rican family. We focus around um, the three sons, but predominantly one of the boys who is acted by Evan Rosado. Absolutely excellent. And this is a film that doesn't really feel like a film. It feels like a documentary because these people don't feel like actors. So the father is incredibly violent towards the mother and, and the three boys witness it. And this film is about how the other two boys start to, you know, reenact this violence. They start to become violent children um, and it's devastating because you see that pattern of how they would then grow up to be violent men how domestic violence and, and all other forms of abuse that parents do to their children or in front of their children can lead to children perpetuating that um, you know on other people and their own children so that's really devastating but you're following um, this one boy who who isn't becoming violent but is instead um, realizing um, his own sexuality and who he is. And this film is beautifully shot and um, phenomenally acted and also has these um, moments where so the main character narrates certain parts of the films and when he does that it turns into like almost like a, a scrapbook where he's drawing and, and the lines move um, so that that style I thought was really beautiful and um, again uh, you know I thought this film was really good but I, it doing that it's one of those films I find this with quite a few of these films I've just spoken about the ones that have got seven out of ten I felt with all of them that I was watching and I was thinking this could still be a really strong film and I was waiting waiting for something to lift and it just doesn't and I really struggle with that that's that sense of when you're watching a film and you're not completely immersed because you're you're sort of aware that you're waiting for something and therefore and therefore you know it's a film you know not real in that moment so um, this felt like that but um, Johnny enjoyed this one more than me he gave it 8 out of 10 so I, I would still recommend it um, and I think it was absolutely beautifully shot then we're on to the top two and I really enjoyed both of these films gave them both an 8 out of 10 an 8 out of 10 for films is like super high um, 
I think I'm harsher on films because, I, you know, I said this to Johnny, I feel like there's more things to criticise. Um, with a book, obviously there's loads of things that go into writing a book, um, but with a film, there's so many actors, um, the, the cinematography can let it down, um, I'm, I'm not someone who enjoys when the camera zooms in a lot or, or moves quickly, so there's lots of things that can put it down, they just aren't a part of the book. So um, I tend to be harsher, so an 8 is like very high, okay? So I very rarely give 9s and 10s are almost impossible. So even less 10s than I've ever given 5 stars to books, just to, for some context here. So the next film is The Nightingale, it's directed by Jennifer Kent. She also directed The Babadook, which is a brilliant Australian horror film that Johnny and I loved. If you haven't seen it and you like horror films, what are you doing? It's one of the best horror films out there in my humble opinion. <laughs> so this film features Ashling Franciosi and Bakali Ganamba. Uh, both of them are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I've seen Ashling before in the fall and I thought she was excellent. This film, they are both like independently brilliant but also the chemistry between the two of them is excellent. So this film I'm just going to say has all the trigger warnings so if you don't want to hear about like awful things like skip to the next film. This film is set in 1825 Tasmania and very simply you could say it is a revenge film but it's so much more than that. This film has excellent commentary on British colonialism in Australia at the time. We follow this white Irish woman who's been sent to Tasmania as a convict and she's trying to work out her sentence and we follow uh, an Aboriginal man who is um, finding that all of his family and loved ones are being killed by the British soldiers and they are losing all of their land. And the, the film opens with you finding out that Ashling's character is being sexually assaulted by one of the captains uh, and he's unwilling to release her from her sentence because he wants to carry on sexually assaulting her. Um, her husband confronts the captain and one of the most horrific events I've seen in films ensues. So there is a scene where yeah it, like sexual assault of the worst kind, brutal murder and death of a child. Like I'm just going to give you a heads up of that because it is fucking awful. Johnny and I had a big discussion after we watched this film about how necessary it is to include scenes like that in films. We were saying you know is it better to pan the camera away so you can just hear what's happening and not see it? Is it better to not see the scene at all but see the aftermath so you, so you know what's happened? And what does that take away? Because this film is a commentary on a historical event and it chooses the, you know, two of the people who would have been the most subjugated by the British soldiers. You know, one a white woman who's, who's being, you know, she's a convict, she's under these men's power so she's being sexually assaulted. Um, and one an Aboriginal man. So. The commentary is excellent and we were both saying would it, is it disrespectful to, to not show those scenes you know this is history this happened and by saying this is too much for us to look at is that is that that are saying well no i don't want to know that happened i don't want to learn anything because you know i don't want to see it so it, it was a really interesting discussion we, we both came away from it that like we can watch scenes like that makes you feel awful and um, but we completely understand why a, a lot of people would not want to watch scenes like that. If I had to make like a top 10 list of like the most brutal films I've seen this would definitely make it in. I mean it's not just that scene there's awful um, sexual assault and violence against lots of Aboriginal characters throughout the film so it's, it's very difficult to watch but it's excellent. Like I said they're both brilliant, um, the commentary is brilliant, the cinematography is excellent, it's so believable that you're in 1825. Yeah, I'd really recommend this and I will, you know, continue to watch both of their careers and, you know, watch any film that Jennifer Kent brings out. So I need to have a look at what other films she has in her um, in her list. And then the last one I want to talk about here is Wave. So I'd probably give this like 8.5. Right, I don't do like 0.5s but I did enjoy this one just a little bit more than The Nightingale. Um, this is directed by Trey Edward Schultz who directed Krisha which is an absolutely phenomenal film. Um, completely loved it. If you haven't seen Krisha you have to. So I really wanted to watch Waves and I had a bit of um, 
concern about this one because Trey Edward Schultz is a white man and this is a film about a black family so I was a little bit unsure but it but it is excellent and, and it has um, I think he, he dealt with it well you know he directed and wrote it um, and this is about a, a family who are incredibly successful and very wealthy and the father puts an insane amount of pressure on his son and particularly to excel in sports and um, which leads the son to um, once he has an injury to push himself past the point of, of, of endurance um, and this is a film of two halves so, so the first half is, is watching that relationship and you build up to a point where something happens and you're just watching thinking oh my god this is the worst thing ever and Johnny and I discussed this afterwards and I was like it's one of those moments where if this was real life and it feels like real life you know I will say that a triad world should so I think that's his trademark his films feel like you're just a fly on the wall like I can't believe this family don't exist and there's this scene where where you think obviously somebody's to blame but I just can't blame anyone here and it's devastating that that moment happened and that these people's lives are all affected um, it's just awful and then the film has sort of a second half which is um, more focused on on the sister and it is equally beautiful uh, it's a wonderful scene where um, she's sitting with her father um, beside a river while he's fishing I think and they have a conversation it's just crystalline it's so beautiful so this film is you know shot so beautifully the colors are excellent the main actor who i just want to to mention is kelvin harrison jr I and mean, you may have seen him in the is it the trial of the chicago seven um, he acts fred who is the black panther who is sitting behind bobby seal a lot in the trials so he's not in it much um but he he is phenomenal in waves um and there's a yeah there's another scene where him and his sister uh, are in a bathroom together and it's a super emotional scene and I was just watching it thinking how could anyone act this and this just not be their actual life it, it's insane um so yeah highly recommend Waves and The Nightingale so yeah out of the 10 you know obviously I'd rather way more of them were seven and eight and that maybe even one of them was a nine um, but we had a lot of lower numbers but we had a look at the other the rest of them and we're hoping the next 10 could score a bit higher so i'm not going to make any promises about how quickly we're going to watch them because they're still a depressing group of films and um not necessarily what we need right now <laughs> but um we will get to them eventually and i will do another check-in video like this one Thank you so much for watching i'm sure this is incredibly long i need to edit it now um let me know if you've seen any, any of these films i'd love to know if you agree or disagree with me and why i'm always open to hearing um you know people's reasoning also let me know if you have any recommendations based on the films i really enjoyed um any directors you think i should be aware of um you know just anything like that i would love to have more films to add to my to watch list which is probably as long as my to read list <laughs> thanks so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video Bye.